Hello, and uh, welcome to our third uh, desk side chat uh, of uh, film production reboot post COVID-19, uh, discussing the cutting edge issues of how COVID-19 affects you, the independent filmmaker. Um, I'm David Albert Pierce, managing partner of Pierce Law Group. This presentation is uh, brought to you by uh, Slam Dance Film Festival uh, and Movie Maker Magazine. Um, Slam Dance uh, Film Festival uh, is uh, currently open to accept submissions for independent films. Uh, despite everything uh, being in rather uncertain and ever shifting state right now, Slam Dance remains committed to supporting and showcasing independent filmmakers no matter what form uh, that will take this year. Uh, we can't wait to watch your films and uh, Slam Dance knows how important it is to make sure the world sees the most daring, original, and thought-provoking works that come Slam Dance's way. Slam Dance Film Festival, um, save money by submitting uh, early prior to July 13th uh, for your independent film uh, and that festival. I uh, also want to thank Movie Maker Magazine um, if you're a filmmaker trying to finish a project now, especially if you're in post or looking for publicity help, uh, our friends at Movie Maker have a program called Movie Maker Production Services, where they'll double your budget through partnerships with their sponsors. Uh, if you have a starting budget of at least $10,000, they can double it for you. You just want to email tim at moviemaker.com, or you can direct message them at the at sign, Movie Maker Mag. Uh, it's Movie Maker Magazine and their filmmaker uh, support group program. Um, well, let's get right into it right now. Uh, we, uh, America is uh, reopening for business and we need to learn how to reopen safely. Um, just a little background information about me for those who are speed readers, I'm not gonna stick too long on this. Uh, Pierce Law Group does both uh, entertainment uh, litigation uh, and transactional matters. Um, in, we do everything from soup to nuts, from film financing to distribution deals, uh, all of your uh, intellectual property, cast and crew agreements, um, licenses, location releases, uh, other clearance releases, and uh, general uh, uh, crisis management uh, for whenever you're uh, on the set and all of those unusual things that uh, arise during, uh, during a production that you never thought were gonna happen, but they just do. Um, so uh, with, with that said as to who I am and uh, why I'm speaking to you today, let's get right into it about the, the restart of productions um, here in California, they've given the green light to restart uh, in many other areas around the country and around the world. They have equally uh, given the green light um, and permission to start. Uh, with that said, uh, there are a uh, lot of requirements that filmmakers have never previously had to deal with. Uh, you have to uh, deal with uh, COVID-19. Um, SAG will not let you begin productions, won't even let you make an offer to actors until you present uh, a COVID-19 plan to them that meets their approval. Uh, so uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Station 12, the requirement uh, right before production to make sure that all of your, um, your uh, actors are, uh, are eligible to, to, to work for, for union rules. Um, you can almost think of it as uh, an early uh, Station 12 requirement back when the, uh, the offers are going out. You need SAG's green light to even make those offers. They want to see that you are COVID-19 compliant. Um, also, uh, if you are dealing with any sophisticated financier, they too uh, are going to require you to be COVID-19 compliant. Uh, I was just working yesterday with a uh, 
a, a small studio that's getting ready to gear up production in July. They're dealing with their, their, uh, their bank, uh, their lender, and uh, they, they had to get out, uh, you know, first thing today, their COVID policy for that lender to look over um, so they feel satisfied and comfortable uh, giving their money over to a production uh, that is not uh, going to uh, wind up having to shut down because all of its actors and, and crew members are uh, in need of uh, ventilators, uh, God forbid. Um, perhaps the, uh, the biggest thing, aside from the fact that you do have uh, the federal OSHA law, which has a general rule that has always been in place, uh, that requires employers to have a general duty to provide a safe workplace for all employees. Um, and uh, this clause requires employers to keep their workplaces free of serious recognized harms. Um, and uh, and uh, that goes for both not only injuries, but illnesses that can occur in the workplace. So there, that's the general all-encompassing federal law. Uh, many states, such as California, have an equivalent state law. It's called CalOSHA. And though that general rule parrots uh, what the federal rule says. You have an obligation to provide a safe, a safe and healthy workplace for all of your employees. Now, um, aside from these federal and state rules to provide a, sa a safe and healthy workplace for recognized hazards, and COVID-19 is now a recognized uh, hazard, um, there, are, there, there are issues separate and apart from the law, uh, primarily um, your, your your financing, as I said earlier, not, not only do banks want to see your, your uh, COVID-19 plan, but completion bond companies want to see your COVID-19 plan. And uh, more importantly, completion bond companies are absolutely requiring that you have insurance for that covers COVID-19 issues. Now, uh, the problem with that is, as of uh, last week, and I know things change very quickly, and I was going to make a call to some of my assorted uh, insurance brokers and agents and people that have the pulse uh, on, uh, on, on these type of things uh, early this morning, um, but I did not uh, get, a, get a chance to get through to them. Uh, but as of last week in my conversations with all of them, there is no a national or even international insurance group that is presently writing uh, COVID-19 uh, coverage. Um, and, uh, you know, we are keeping track of this. If, if, if something changed over the last, uh, you know, four or five business days, um, I'm sure someone can, uh, can chime in. I don't, I have the ability to read my chat boxes here now, but, uh, Somebody will uh, likely likely do that, um, and uh, we will let you know. We'll keep you uh, abreast of uh, the developments in in the insurance world. Um, but it's a real catch twenty um, two. And let me see where we uh, because um, you know just because the the state. Uh, and other jurisdictions have said you can commence production, uh, it doesn't mean you'll be able to. Um, you know, if, because uh, it, it, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that COVID-19 insurance. And the catch-22 is as problematic as the COVID-19, which means the catch-22 being you're required to have a completion bond if you're working with any sophisticated financer Certainly, if it's a lender, um, certainly the more uh, sophisticated repeat equity players are always going to require a completion bond. And if you're working with those type of people, you're going to have to have a completion bond to get the money. You're going to have to have insurance company insurance coverage in order to get the completion bond. 
that's your catch 22 and the catch 22 can be as problematic as the COVID-19. Um, as I said, the insurance companies have yet to start issuing COVID-19 policies as of when I last checked around last Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so maybe some new developments have arisen over the last four or five days. Uh, I would think that some insurance carrier somewhere is willing to price this risk. Um, it may be uh, extremely expensive insurance, but uh, with so much of COVID, uh, it is, you know, we're dealing with a pandemic that is going to be uh, a premium that you need to factor in to each and every one of your budgets. So whatever you, if you did a budget before COVID-19, go back and factor in all of the additional costs uh, that are going to be a result of the COVID-19 surcharge. And what do I mean by the COVID-19 surcharge? You're going to have to have extra employees um, for the purposes of cleaning the, the set and overseeing the proper protocols, which we're going to discuss um, you know, further in on this, this webinar. Uh, you're also going, you might also uh, not be able to get as many of your uh, day of days completed uh, as your original shoot schedule was. Shooting schedules may be delayed because it'll take longer with makeup, with wardrobe, uh, because you can't have everybody together. Um, your, your meals uh, period perhaps may be longer. Um, you're going to have less people on the set. You won't be able to do so much, uh, as much multitasking. Uh, because you're going to want to limit the amount of people uh, that are around. Um, so there are uh, certainly a lot of uh, additional expenses that will arise with um, the COVID-19 uh, issues that you are going to need to address. Um, and, in, and insurance is just one additional cost what those premiums are going to look like, stay tuned. Uh, we are, you know, checking every week uh, with, uh, you know, the absolute top brokers in the industry. Um, and as of last week, I was getting all of the same answers. Uh, check back with us. We're not finding any companies that are willing to issue uh, coverage quite yet. And that makes sense. You can understand why that would be. Uh, they're already reeling with uh, all of the unexpected claims that COVID-19 um, is, uh, you know, is, uh, is presenting um, to those insurance carriers, uh, all the forced business interruption cases uh, that are coming in, and all of these other claims uh, for policies that never anticipated a pandemic uh, and failed to uh, fully and expressly carve out the COVID-19 pandemic from coverage. And the way insurance law works is um, if there is any ambigu ambiguity, any doubt, uh, all of that goes in favor of the insured and against the insurance company. So if it's arguably covered, it's covered. So anyone that was in the middle of production and got um, shut down by the government orders, if you had an insurance policy, you're probably in good shape. They may be making a fuss and kicking and screaming, uh, but um, you're probably in good shape. Here's a question, this is great. Keep bringing these questions as you can and could shut that door as well, that would be wonderful. Um, the question is, uh, PPI, want to know if you're talking about workers' comp or general liability insurance. Um, uh, we are talking about uh, general liability insurance. Um, however, uh, I'm glad you brought up the issue of workers' comp um, because if your employees are uh, injured or contract an illness while at work or on duty, uh, that is covered by workers' compensation. And um, 
first let me pause and say that is a good thing. Workers' compensation is a production company's best friend. Um, and the reason for that is because the workers' compensation uh, bargain is this. In exchange for there being no fault, meaning the question is simply, was the employee injured at work or on duty, or was he not? And if the question is, it was injured at work, then you don't have any discussion of negligence. You don't have any discussion of intentional harm. You could have done everything absolutely right. He could have done everything absolutely wrong. But if there was an injury in the workplace or on duty, it's covered by workers' comp. But Dave, you said workers' comp is our best friend. That doesn't sound like a good thing. If I went to court, I could argue my case that I'm not on, on the line for this. Well, workers' comp is your best friend because in exchange for you not having the ability to argue anything other than was it or was it not occurring uh, while at work and on duty, you get a definitive answer as to how much that employee gets. You eliminate the, uh, the, the uh, uncertainty of what a jury may do in terms of issuing an award for punitive damages and uh, determining what the emotional distress is and, uh, and what you know, 12 people in a jury box think this injury is worth versus what actuaries determine the injury to be worth. And when you're on workers comp, everything is a schedule, everything is a table, everything is extremely micromanaged in terms of how much is paid out. It goes by exactly how old the person is, what type of job they have, what type of injury they have. Everything is based on ratings and uh, there is a number that is kicked out on the basis of a formula. And when you are dealing with uh, catastrophic loss or something like a COVID-19 situation, I would much rather have that formula applied where the numbers are, are punched in and you know exactly what that amount is rather than have 12 members uh, of a jury, um, you know, scratching their head and just, uh, just, you know, flying by the seat of their pants in determining how much money the, uh, the employee is entitled to receive. So workers' compensation is great protective measure um, for you. Uh, and I, am, I imagine that workers' comp premiums may go up. I don't believe um, presently that that is uh, as big an issue as the general liability uh, insurance uh, issues are. Um, I would think that general liability insurers uh, should recognize that at least the employee injury stuff should be covered entirely by workers' comp. So what is the general liability insurers uh, concern here? Why are they afraid to price this product? Well, it's that business interruption insurance. It's the idea of, you know, what happens if the production has to completely shut down? It's uh, while workers' comp covers the, uh, the cost of the illness and injury, the cost of the uh, medical treatment, yeah, the business interruption insurance is going to cover um, the, all of the contractual losses uh, for money that you're still going to need to pay, um, you know, regardless of, of where the production is. It's also going to pay for all of the um, consequential losses, your inability to finish the film. Um, where does general liability insurance and business interruption uh, end? and a completion bond begin. 
Um, well, that's uh, the topic of another uh, desk side chat. And, um, you know, that's something that's parceled out between the completion bond company and the insurance carriers. Again, that gets back to our original question of, you know, why the completion bond companies will only issue a completion bond if you have uh, insurance coverage for COVID-19. Uh, the completion bond company, uh, their benefit of the bargain, what you get in exchange for you giving, uh, say, 2% of the, the budget of your, the overall budget of your film, you are giving that to the completion bond company. They, in essence, are giving you a type of insurance that says, come hell or high water, if you go uh, over budget uh, on this movie, uh, they will come in and provide the finishing funds to make sure that your film is in the can and ready for delivery to the, to the distributor. Uh, but like any uh, insurance type provider, uh, everybody likes to take that bet. Everybody likes to take that premium. Uh, nobody likes to pay that out. And they wanna take every step possible to minimize the risk of a payout. Uh, and currently uh, completion bonds are saying, what we need to minimize our threats of a payout, we need insurance coverage. And um, I suppose you could uh, uh, have a carve out with the completion bond company that says, you do not have to pay if the reason for cost overruns and an inability to deliver the film is because of COVID-19. Um, if your uh, investors and financiers are comfortable with that, then maybe that's the way to go about it. Um, but if you're dealing with a traditional lender, and I think if you're dealing with a serious repeat player in the world of uh, entertainment financing, um, I don't foresee them uh, willing to play ball and make that exception. Um, but at some point, as one, as Peter Graham from uh, 120DB, a, a longtime film lender and sophisticated film financier for, for years and years said, you know, they're in the business of you know, financing films, that's, that's their business, that's how they make money, uh, and they want to be in business, they want to do deals, they don't want to be sitting on the sidelines. Um, so maybe there'll be some, uh, you know, some uh, innovative solution to all of this, or maybe an insurance carrier is going to be able to uh, finally price the risk, and I'm sure that they have their own actuaries that are running charts and, and uh, looking at all the latest data and trying to um, uh, come up with, uh, with a way to issue a policy. So that goes back to uh, the first part uh, of this slide, which is um, if you don't mean, a if it doesn't mean a thing, if you ain't got that COVID-19 insurance, and then I have under it says, Indies may, like, uh, may likely proceed um, but any production requiring a pleasure bond may be in trouble. Here's where you, the independent filmmaker, actually have a leg up on studios because I know I work with a lot of you, many of you, most of you, you know, in the you know under five million range are not are doing so without a completion bond. Even some of you above the five million range, when you're not dealing with sophisticated lenders or sophisticated financiers are moving forward with the out of completion bond. So you do not have the hurdles and uh, impediments that the, the majors and mini majors are facing in this issue. Um, all in all, it's enough to wanna make you swallow bottle Lysol, uh, but we don't want you to be doing that. So assuming you do get, you, you have your financing and uh, the, the, the state and jurisdiction which you're in has given the green light to do production, Let's take a look at how that production is going to uh, evolve and what you're going to do. Um, so we talked about the general safety rule under the federal law. 
is you have a duty to provide a safe workplace and then there's a bunch of other safe standards that need to be uh, be imposed. Um, everyone is also supposed to have a, a safety manual. And again, filmmaking is generally uh, classified as a hazardous activity. You know, people get injured, people die on movie sets and uh, the government is aware of it and they want to see, um, you know, even on an independent film, a proper safety manual that addresses known hazards. And now that COVID-19 is a known hazard, not only are you gonna have, you know, uh, you know, separate and apart from your regular safety manual, we're going to have a COVID-19 safety manual. And um, what, what are some of the things we want to, to have in that? Well, uh, you want to make sure that you're appointing a COVID-19 safety director. Now, uh, all of you should know that the, 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 the crew member who is the single responsibility for supervising and ensuring safety on the set, while safety is everybody's responsibility, the one guy who's really, um, you know, holds uh, responsibility for that is the first AD. And, uh, you know, people always ask, you know, that's so odd. Why is the first AD in charge of overseeing all safety issues? Well, it actually, whoever first came up with this was really brilliant because they understand that what is the first AD's primary job uh, uh, duty? It's to make sure that the production stays on time and on budget. And, and the first AD does that by making sure that they get all the shots that are required to be shot for each day of shooting. And the first AD is the guy with the bullhorn that's saying, come on people, hurry up, hurry up. We're losing the sun. We need to set this. We got to get this scene. Let's go. Okay, check the gate. We're, we're off with this one. Let's get set up for the next, right? He's the timekeeper. So it makes sense. What if, if you didn't have the first AD primarily responsible for the safety on the set and it's his fault if some, you know, as to, hey, what happened here? Why did this injury arise? If that wasn't his responsibility and his, own, or his or her only responsibility was to make sure you get your days, you're going to have a guy speeding. And speed leads to potential safety hazards and injuries. So let's make the same guy who wants to speed be the same guy who is policing safety so that you don't go any faster than what is the proper rate of travel so that no injuries occur in the workplace. It was really, really brilliant. Many of you might not have uh, ever thought about that, the correlation between why the first AD is the safety uh, guy um, and is also the guy who makes sure that uh, things are running on time. Uh, that was a masterful uh, delegation of duties. So with the COVID-19, it's my belief, and I've, I've heard from some people that some first ADs are kicking up a fuss and saying, we don't want to be responsible for this. Um, well, you're ultimately in charge of safety. We're, we're going to have a COVID-19 safety director uh, that you know is just focused on that, but you, the first AD, need to be responsible for all safety issues, and that includes COVID-19. And in order to have a seamless set, in order to have a seamless policy, a coherent safety plan, you need to have the first AD regularly talking to your COVID-19 safety director. The two have to be in cahoots and understand what's going on. And the first AD has to understand that because of these new COVID-19 protocols, he's gonna have to slow down the pace a little bit to account for the implementation of those protocols. Um, in, we wanna make sure that you're, you're going to have to ensure social distancing and we're going to go into details about uh, how you, you do that. Having essentially um, one of the ways, aside from following all of the basic rules that we hear in the public service announcements, stay six feet away, wear your mask, um, have uh, you know, protected 
face shields, um, wear gloves, uh, those type of things. Uh, wash your hands frequently. Those are all part of the social distancing rules. We also want to maintain a strict closed set. Um, Filmmaking is not going to be as much fun. Uh, you know, the only people that should be on location and on a set should be those that absolutely need to be there. And when should they appear to set? Only when they absolutely need to be. So schedule their call times, get, you know, make, schedule them proper, uh, make sure you're, um, you're, you're structuring it so that not everybody's showing up at the same time. If someone doesn't need to be there until a certain time, don't require them or even permit them to be there any earlier than they absolutely need to be. And when their work is completed, they should not stick around. I know usually people want to let's stick around and, oh, they're going to film that scene. That should be funny. Oh, they're going to do that stunt. I want to stick around and watch that. This was all a part of regular filmmaking, what's made filmmaking fun. That was what's fun to be in a crew. It's fun just to, you know, have a BS session around the craft service table and talk to people. Filmmakers are incredibly interesting people, be it the actors, the crew. I love hanging out at film sets in a COVID-19 world that just can't happen. And you can't be, if you're a producer and you want to bring your investors on, you know, on the set, which a lot of them want to do, I just don't know if that really uh, amounts to, um, to uh, you know, an essential person. And you really need to limit the people to only those people that are going to be essential. Um, as I mentioned, you want to provide uh, the, uh, the, the sanitizers, your wipes, your mask, your gloves, your face shields. Um, consider having work groups sequestered with each other. What does that mean? All of the people that need to interact with one another in, within, you know, you know the, the, while still maintaining social distancing, you want to corral them all together. Uh, so the cast, makeup artist, uh, hair people, they can all be, um, you know, can, can, can stay together in one area. Um, you know, if, if particularly if you're traveling people to a location. They can all be in the same section of the hotel and to the extent they are permitted to socialize with anyone, they should socialize with the folks that are designated within their zone. Your camera people uh, and grips are, are going to be segregated together. Um, have your set decorators and prop designers, you know, in a separate group. And if they can come on and do their stuff, you know, hours before the camera crew and grip gets there, then that's what should be done. Um, there are a lot of innovative ways of, uh, of dealing with um, the segregation and sequestering of employees. And this is, the, it's not a one size fits all situation. Um, you're going to have to have different rules if you're using just all local hires who are sleeping at their house at night versus people that you are traveling. Um, there, you know, as you, you may have read, uh, you know, Tyler Perry at his studios has created essentially, you know, one big camp that everyone is going to stay right in this uh, perimeter area and you're never going to leave. The food's going to be brought into you. Whatever socializing you're permitted is going to be more um, uh, computer oriented and you're going to stay and you're not going to go out to bars at night when you're off duty uh, and uh, or go to restaurants and, and that type of thing. Um, it does present some interesting wage hour issues, but I think all in all, um, people should be voluntarily willing to comply for the good of the production for everyone to not put themselves at risk, 
because if they put themselves at risk, well, they're going to wind up being quarantined for 14 days and going to be losing a great opportunity to be working on the film. Uh, and more importantly, they're going to be putting their co-workers at risk. So uh, there are a lot of innovative ways to deal with the social distancing, to deal with sequestering of people. Um, generally, extras are not um, treated particularly well on, uh, on any size budget of a film. Uh, they're usually all corralled together in a big extra pen. Um, we're going to have to make sure that social distancing, at very least six feet apart. And if you could spread them out even more um, and give, you know, they all start to get their own little uh, separate structures, uh, similar to what a day player would get. Um, or in a, you know, of, of some sort of private dressing room area. Uh, you'll need to factor in these type of, of things. Um, so uh, think about it. We have uh, already gone forward and developed a COVID-19 compliant uh, policy for one of our clients that will soon be engaging uh, in production. They happen to be particularly lucky because prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, they thinking in advance, not thinking of advance of the COVID-19, but just being well-prepared, well-prepared line producers, producers, executives, they had their insurance already lined up. They didn't wait until, you know, four weeks before production or two weeks before production to contact an insurance broker. They did it at day one. So even though they're planning on starting in the summer uh, and they may have, maybe they were gonna start a little bit early but they postponed, they already had their insurance coverage in place. Similarly, uh, any, um, any film that was disrupted that restarts production, I believe, you know, you have to check your insurance policies, but if they, if they had the coverage for the film, that's gonna stick there. So they too would have their insurance uh, uh, coverage in place. So that particular um, studio uh, was able to, to, to solidify all of its financing and completion bond because they have the insurance and that insurance carrier has to just be wringing their hands because they weren't able to issue a COVID-19 carve out because the policy was bought before COVID-19. So um, we've drafted their safe, their, their, their COVID-19 plan. We're still putting some finishing touches on it. We're really proud of the way it looks. And uh, if any of you are uh, moving into production, we can do the same for you. And again, uh, I think COVID-19, uh, just like any other contract, you know, is, is just, it's not something cookie cutter. Don't just get it off offline. Don't just say, well, this is the what our other production used or our friend used. I've curtailed this particular one to comply with Texas state law. You know, every state has a slightly different standard. Texas has a, a standard for what temperature uh, is, um, is too high and someone has to go home which might be lower than another state's temperature standard. So please, this should go across the board with any contracts and forms you use. I know, you know every line producer has a little toolkit that has you know, lawyer agreements that they got from 10 years ago from some, some uh, production they worked with. Every time you do that, it's like taking someone else's medical prescription. Yeah, 80% of the time, it may work fine for you and be just what's needed. But 20% of the time, you might have a terrible allergic reaction and it could be the absolute worst contract because it wasn't custom tailored for your needs. It was custom tailored for someone else's needs. Worst case, you know, best case scenario, you're giving away more than you needed to give in a particular situation by using those form contracts. So. When you reach out to a lawyer, know that you're really not, you shouldn't be paying the lawyer for their forms. You're paying them for all the knowledge of uh, uh, understanding 
what are in those forms and how those forms should be properly tweaked for your particular production. Um, and note that each safety plan, each COVID-19 plan should really focus particularly on how we're gonna keep these people separated, how the logistics are gonna work. They really should be thoughtfully engaged in and done in a way that um, you know, is specific for your project. Um, common areas, high traffic uh, uh, areas, um, they need to have cleaning enhancements. Uh, there should be a deep clean every day and throughout the day, it should, cleaning should be visibly occurring and frequently occurring, focusing on what's known as high touch points. Uh, each, each morning on the set, you know, I, I, your prudent practice is you should always have a 10 minute safety meeting um, that uh, the, the first day everyone gets their, uh, uh, the call sheets, uh, you know, handed out. People are told um, what the unique uh, features of filmmaking are gonna be that day. Today, we're gonna have pyrotechnics. Today, there's gonna be a stunt. Uh, it's gonna be really hot. We're filming in the desert. Make sure you stay stay hydrated, you know, there should always be a 10 minute safety meeting at the start of every day of production led by the first AD that talks about, you know, the, the, the unique hazards that might be faced that day. And if there are no unique hazards, just brush up on good common safety. The idea is to have safety always in the crew's mind. Now implement into that 10 minute safety meeting, a COVID-19 you know, meeting. So it's always in people's mind, reminding them of what's occurring. You also want to make sure that at the start of each workday, I would recommend at the middle of each workday and at the end of each workday, the safety uh, COVID director and his team is going around and taking uh, thermometer measurements uh, of um, uh, you know, of, of, of everybody. And uh, if they, they have a temperature of over 100, let them sit down for five minutes, cool off, take it again. If it's still a high temperature, they need, you need to start going into quarantine protocols. You need to have them tested right away. The, uh, the production that I just worked on that's getting ready for, for production in July, their protocol is everybody gets tested when they start work uh, and they have a 24 hour testing turnaround and you can't start work until those test results come in. And then every three days, people be retested. And if they have a fever, they get retested then and they need to sit out um, until that test comes back clean. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a pain in the ass. I get it. And, uh, producers, I'll tell you something else. Not only does that crew member have to sit out, but, um, under the, um, the, the COVID, uh, leave, uh, laws that were passed by Congress, uh, every employee is entitled to up to two weeks of paid sick leave that's, eight, that's broken down into 80 hours. So you can take it in incremental time, just like family medical leave could be taken in incremental time. And they get paid for that time uh, for the, the, the two week period if they are forced to, um, to, to be on the sidelines because their, their temperature was high or because um, they were quarantined. What happens if someone tests positive for COVID-19? You have to do contact tracking. You have to figure out everyone that they've worked uh, with in their department and that whole department needs to get tested and uh, may need to be quarantined uh, for, uh, you know, for, for a time period um, consistent with what the medical directors say at that time. Um, 
you want to do a deep cleaning of the sets and locations every morning and night. And then, as I said, a lot of uh, routine cleaning. Uh, if it's possible to set, to dress a set 48 hours in advance and leave it untouched, that is recommended. If you can't do 48 hours, the more advanced planning that you can do, the better. And again, have the set dressers in there when the cameramen and grips aren't even around. Uh, let's take a look at some questions. We'll stop here. We'll come back to some others. Um, cost of testing kits covered by local, local government or is the production responsibility? If testing is not available for free in your jurisdiction here in California, it's available for free. Um, it is all the cost of medical exams are borne by the employer. Uh, that is the case in, in California. Um, I would say you'd have to check on a juris by jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis if your state laws or uh, international laws uh, have that same requirement that medical testing, just like any other um, item that the employee might need to perform their services, uh, has to be provided at the cost of uh, the employer. So. Um, so masks, gloves, the, uh, the protective eye gear, um, all needs to be provided by the employer at the employer's expense. Very good question. Um, what if production shoots under the umbrella of a company that already has insurance? If you are clearly designated as an additional insured, and I would not just, um, go on the opinion of whoever the parent company is, you know, or, you know, a friend of a friend, I would talk to the insurance broker directly and make sure a hundred percent that coverage exists. And I would want to see a certificate of insurance that says, yes, this production company is definitively a covered production under this larger policy. Because if you don't have that in writing and confirmed, I can tell you, you may see a problem with the insurance carrier when a claim comes in and them saying, hey, you're not the name on our policy. So get it confirmed by your insurance broker, get it in writing, ask to see a separate certificate of insurance with you added as an additional insured. Does size of a production matter? Size always matters. SAG short project uh, re-COVID compliance. Yes, actually, um, it, 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 it will be easier for a small production to comply, but everyone has to comply. Uh, remember the OSHA safety rules are, um, you have a, duty to provide a workplace that is safe, safe and healthy, free from all known potential hazards. So doesn't matter if you have five employees or 500 employees, uh, I would think it will be far easier to implement the protocols if you have five rather than 500. Um, again, another good question. Uh, Let's get back to some of the basic protocols of what need to be in your policy. Um, have a security guard uh, police the entrances uh, and make sure that the six foot rule is always being followed. Um, you don't wanna have any, uh, you know, any, any bypassers if you're filming in public or anything like that, that uh, crosses into uh, the realm of the production company's area. Uh, craft services and meals all need to be boxed and each eaten remotely, not in groups. Uh, I know that's half the fun of making a film is, is uh, bullshitting around the craft service table. Um, here's something to think about. Crowd scenes should be uh, replaced with CGI uh, rather than having 100 people in a crowd. Um, COVID compliant behavior argument versus COVID liability waiver. What's the difference? 
Um, you cannot have an employee waive, uh, sign a waiver that says, if I suffer an illness or injury, I will not sue you. Right? We just talked about that. It's workers' comp exclusivity. Workers' comp exists in all 50 states, and they all are, you know, what, however different they may be, they all share the same characteristic and basic function that is um, if an employee is injured or suffers an illness while at work or on duty, the employer pays and there's no question of fault. So any attempt to have an employee sign a waiver that says, I promise if I suffer COVID-19, I will not sue you, is going to be rendered null and void um, and uh, contrary to what the law requires. You can, I mean, COVID-19 to that extent is no different than any other injury or illness in, in the workplace. Um, it's possible you could have a waiver for uh, people that do not fall within the category of employee. Many of you are saying, aha, I'm going to have everybody be independent contractors. Yeah. This is not the time to play fast and loose with the legal distinction between employees and independent contractors. Um, and California and a number of other states have gotten, who have really closed in hard on who's an independent contractor and who's an employee. Even if you're, they're paid through a loan out, which can be a topic for another desk side chat where I'll tell you why uh, a lot of people think the sky is falling concerning uh, loan outs in light of the California AB5 law, which seeks to render anyone that performs services that are essential to the making of a film, and that's just about everybody, um, maybe not your craft services, maybe not your, your, your lawyers and accountants, well, there, there's special exceptions for them. Um, yeah, but essentially anyone that, that serves the essential function of production needs to be an employee and not an independent contractor. Um, and that is for workers comp concerns. It's also for certain wage hour concerns, but uh, a topic that can be discussed at a, uh, a future chat um, is it's not so much that they're an independent contractor and not employee, as it is really that there's a joint employment relationship when you use the loan out properly. The loan out is the primary employer, the production company is the special employer, you, the, the, the person that owns the loan out that is the employee is being lent out by your, the primary employer to the special employer. So there's two employers involved. And the only thing that's being treated as uh, independent contractor like is the payment of wages where taxes can arguably not be taken out at the special employer level, provided they are duly taken out at the primary employer level, the loan out company level, uh, which is uh, you know what the employee owns. Uh, I digress, that's a, a little more um, sophisticated discussion than, than today. Just know um, you don't want to start playing fast and loose with employees and independent contractors, and there can be no waiver for employees. If you're going to a Trump rally, you're not an employee of Trump. You want to waive your rights to go in a, in a crowded uh, convention hall with uh, 100,000 people um, and everyone screaming and yelling, you know, wave away to your heart's content. We'll let the law, the courts decide uh, how valid those waivers are. Uh, they probably are. They probably are. It's more like going to a sporting event when you enter Dodger Stadium. There's a lot of waivers on the on the back of a Dodgers ticket. Um, but employees cannot waive the right under uh, uh, workers' comp laws. They've already, via workers' comp, waived the rights to sue you in civil court in exchange 
you automatically pay and take care of them via the workers' comp setting. Uh, and then you can sometimes go into the civil court if it was really egregious, if you violated um, some, some OSHA laws uh, and, and, and did it with reckless disregard, there are ways in which an employer can find themselves in civil court um, rather than have the protection of the workers' comp. That's for really egregious stuff. And you could see how some really egregious stuff might happen here with the COVID world. A um, couple other points. Let's see. Uh, we talked about the crowd scenes. Uh, here's something interesting. ADA and HIPAA prohibit you from revealing the names of an employee that has COVID-19 unless the employee grants consent. Here's how this should work. It's got to be a practicality. If someone tests positive for COVID-19, you go to them and say, look, we have to tell everybody in your group that they need to quarantine. You know, do we have your permission to let them know it was you? you know, and encourage them to do the right thing because they would want to know if the shoe was on the other foot. You know, It's gonna be upsetting to crew to know that somebody has it. And in reality, people are probably gonna figure out who it was. So, but if someone is really a jerk and says, no, I don't want my name revealed. Well, then you just say, hey, someone you work with has it, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and you, you still take the same protocol without naming them. Uh, when you take your, the, the person's temperature three times a day, that isn't really considered um, uh, medical uh, information. So I'm told uh, it doesn't have to be treated as um, uh, with, with, with the same level and the same requirements that uh, uh, a COVID-19 finding uh, of, of a positive result would have. Uh, you still want to maintain it confidential. Uh, there's no reason for um, others to really know. Uh, you, I would maintain it in a separate log. Um, and I would keep it in the same, with the same level of confidentiality that you would any other personnel record uh, or, or document that you would consider to be confidential. And I'd keep it probably separate from the personnel file itself. Uh, but um, I, I'm, I'm told that, you know, just recording temperatures is, uh, is, is certainly, um, you know, per permissible. Uh, and um, I'm not too worried about people you know, sharing, you know, that information. Uh, again, if they have a high temperature, you know, we can, we can discuss that offline if that's a, a major issue for you about how to deal with the temperature controls. Um, so we talked about this, uh, um, why these policies are needed. And uh, if you don't have the right policy in place, you're not gonna have insurance. If you don't have insurance, you're not gonna get a completion bond. And if you're not gonna get a completion bond, you're not gonna get financing. And if you don't have financing, the cameras aren't gonna roll. Um, there have been different approaches to how do we develop COVID policies. SAG-AFTRA has developed a bunch of safety tips and they've kind of uh, have been honing in on the different types of SAG members. So they are uh, crafting and are continuing to craft safety tips for COVID-19 that apply to performers versus broadcasters uh, versus recording artists, stunt performers, um, that, that you know, voiceover artists, um, special rules for children on the set. Um, again, I always tell people, uh, you know, children are an expensive lux luxury for an independent film. Find an 18 year old that looks 14 rather than an 18 year old. Um, even under a non pandemic world, you have a whole separate um, rule of labor laws to follow. Our firm specializes in child labor issues for the entertainment industry. And there are a lot of major studios um, that uh, will employ us just to oversee that all of the child labor laws are properly complied with um, in regards to the child actors and getting the appropriate child actor ratifications and such to legally employ a minor. If you're an independent filmmaker working on a shoestring budget, you know, children are a luxury and they are expensive. 
and you don't want to cut corners with safety, particularly when children are involved, because that is not going to go over well in any court of law. And you won't be relegated to workers' comp for that. Lionsgate developed, was one of the first to come out of the chute to develop um, their, uh, their uh, COVID-19 protocols and procedures. Um, and that is available online. You can see what Lionsgate has done. And there was a Hollywood white paper that is becoming the real, um, I think that's going to be the thing that everybody follows. Uh, it's kind of like, um, you know, when, when Sony had the Betamax and the, versus the, the VHS and VHS became the standard and nobody wanted beta. Well, the white paper is like the big, is going to be the VHS of uh, COVID-19 protocols. Who contributed to the white paper? All these folks, all these big name people, um, a lot of production companies, a lot of unions, um, all working together with a lot of uh, um, medical specialists determining what's right. Uh, it focuses on infection control, physical distancing, protecting and supporting cast and crew, and training and education. Um, there are, you know, like I said, every union, every production is going to have specific issues. So don't just take a cookie cutter COVID-19 policy. Make it unique to your policy. Are you filming locally? Are you filming on location? What are the unique circumstances that need to be evaluated from a COVID-19 lens? Um, you know, are you involving animals? Do you have minors? You know, these are all things that if it relates to your film, you wanna have properly in there. Um, special considerations for wardrobe care and makeup. Um, for location stouting, for extras, um, you know, film permitting. Make sure that your COVID-19 protocols are ADA compliant. You know, is there anything in your COVID protocols that presents a problem for those with disabilities? This morning, I, I heard on uh, Good Morning America about a guy who refused to wear a mask on an American Airlines plane because he claims he had a disability that prevented him from wearing a mask. And, you know, they tossed the guy off the plane, but then they had to let him back on because they're not allowed to ask. All they're supposed to ask is, do you have a disability? And they're not supposed to inquire the disability. Now, an employer has a little bit more freedom to uh, structure uh, an ADA exam with an employee, with employee who is working because they do have the right to ensure the safety of not only that disabled employee, but those who work around them. Uh, but you do want to see, is there, are there some type of uh, disability concerns and what type of accommodations need to be made for that? Um, before you go into this, before you even do or as part of your creation of your COVID-19 protocols and policies, create checklists. Checklists are a wonderful thing. You know, brilliant minds can come up with what needs to do be done, put it in a checklist form, and less brilliant minds can implement it. Um, you know, you want to make sure that the policy is covering everything. How are you going to communicate your policy with employees and the public? Are there going to be posting? Everybody should get one. The question about a COVID-19 liability waiver versus a compliance agreement, well, that, that is where you want to use the compliance agreement. You want to have an employee receive the six, seven page COVID-19 uh, protocols, employee acknowledgement at the end. I have read and shall comply with all of the terms and protocols set forth in this COVID-19 policy. And I understand if I fail to do so, you know, I may be terminated without, you know, any further discipline. Get them to sign. The same way you have them sign a no harassment policy and a commitment to adhere to that. One, it's educating them. Two, it's giving them advance notice. Don't follow the rules and you're out. 
difference between a uh, compliance agreement uh, and an acknowledgement of the policy versus a liability waiver. And I know that most people call what I just talked about a waiver. It's really not a legal waiver. Um, you could, if you're just having a guest on the set and a guest is essential for some reason and is not an employee, sign a waiver that says, uh, you know, if you come in here, you're not get, you know, and you get COVID, you're not going to blame us. But always check on the specific facts and circumstances of what the law and the jurisdiction is and what the relationship is to that party. Uh, but it's generally not going to fly with employees. Um, other things, your, your, your cooling and air conditioning systems, you want to make sure that those are checked and properly cleaned. Um, we've talked about a lot of these other issues, you know, disinfect the props. Um, minors should be, be accompanied by up to two adults and, you know, you got to keep extra clo close eye on them. You should always be keeping a close eye on minors anyways, because filmmaking is a dangerous activity. And, you know, let's face it, some of the crew, if they weren't working on a film crew would be essentially circus roustabouts and drifters. And, uh, you know, you want to keep an eye on, on some of those folks, uh, if there's a, uh, you know, 13 year old running around the set. Um, think about things like uh, uh, pens uh, and, and uh, you know, having them being disposable or once somebody has a pen, they keep it. A uh, lot of little things, but they, they make sense and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, a lawyer is gonna have these protocols already ready, the checklist to give you. Um, you can also, you know, go online and find a lot of these sources. A lot of government sites provide that information. Uh, communicate with the employee, a copy of the protocol with a signed acknowledgement um, and have some signage posted uh, all about as constant reminders. And of course, have your 10 minute tool talk. So real quickly, um, Los Angeles has allowed films and television to, to reopen. Um, uh, but you're going to need to have the protocols in place. Uh, an interesting thing uh, that is unique to California, I don't know, maybe other states have adopted this, but there's an executive order that says if an employee contracts COVID-19, it is presumed they contracted it in the workplace. Remember I said workers' comp applies to any illness or injury that they contract while at work or on duty. Your argument would be, well, how do I know you didn't get it at home? How do I know you didn't get it at that bar you went to uh, with a thousand people or the protest rally that you went to on your day off? In California, there is a presumption, a rebuttable presumption that you got it at work. That means if you know they went to a rally or to a crowded bar, and particularly if there was news that that crowded bar or rally led to COVID-19 spread, and you have no other spread in your uh, company, then you may win that rebuttable presumption. But it starts off with the presumption that they got it in the workplace. That's set to expire July 6th. Um, I'm sure that will be extended uh, probably through the end of the year. Um, so, uh, Let's see, uh, you wanna ensure compliance with your jurisdiction, uh, Florida, Nevada, Texas, South Dakota, Montana, and Illinois have all um, adopted some different rules that relate to filming, as has Missouri, Hawaii, and North Carolina. All of these states are open for business for filming, as are Oakland, Oregon, and Colorado. So whatever jurisdiction, oh, and Georgia, New York, and Washington. Um, whatever jurisdiction you're filming in, take the time to figure out if there's something unique in what that particular law may require. Same thing goes for international if you're filming overseas. Um, Austria, Poland, Spain, New Zealand, UK, Czech Republic, Iceland, Portugal, Canada, France, Russia, and Czech Republic. I guess we said Czech Republic twice. I like Czech Republic. Um, 
you know, they all have different policies and protocols. I, they're pretty much saying the exact same thing I've spent the last 45 minutes talking about. So uh, you do want to take a once over of what that jurisdiction looks like because you want to make sure you're in compliant. And the one thing you don't want to be is non-compliant in a foreign country uh, because, you know, some of them might have very different laws for non-compliance than uh, the slap on the wrist that uh, uh, America might give you. Um, what are some helpful resources? I'm a helpful re resource. We can walk you through it step by step. Um, we custom tailor production documents. We draft safety manuals and COVID-19 compliance programs. We will help you train supervisors. We will help uh, uh, in crisis management for COVID-19 or any other situation. We've been doing this for an awful long time. And uh, I'm always reminded of the uh, Dustin Hoffman's portrayal of Bob Evans in uh, Wag the Dog, where every time someone comes to him with a problem, he just throws his hands up and says, that's not a problem. You want to know what a problem is? I'll tell you about a real problem. And he goes on to talk about some, you know, amazing, you know, difficult catastrophe that happened on any of his, you know, hundreds of productions over, that he's seen over, you know, his, his, his 50 year career. Um, we feel a little bit that way. We've worked on hundreds of productions and it's very, very rare that we ever raise an eyebrow and say, well, wow, that's a new one. You know, the facts may be a little different, the situation may be a little different, but the overall problems, the legal issues that are raised when a crisis arises, we've, we've pretty much you know, confronted everything and anything, and we have experience with how to both hopefully prevent those things and how to nip them in the bud and how to solve them when they arise. Um, you know, part of our production council services is your ability to call and say, you're not gonna believe this, but this just happened, help. And uh, more often than not, we're, we're pretty darn good at, at offering that help. We can also advise you on force majeure issues and insurance issues. And every crew member, a deal memo, if you're using cast and crew mem uh, memos from six months ago that come out of your UPM's you know, toolkit, that needs to be dusted off for at least no other reason than addressing COVID-19 and force majeure. And in some situations, you may want COVID-19 to be a force majeure. You know, when you want to hold somebody else to their obligation, you want the opportunity to say force majeure and hit the tolling button and say, don't you go anywhere, you still owe an obligation to me. In other situations where you're the one that's giving the obligation, you may not want to hit the tolling button and say, you still owe an obligation to me. You may want to say, let's call it quits. Let's recognize this contract's purpose was frustrated and let's return everybody to their original position either, you know, we owe no further obligation moving forward, or we, we make it like we never contracted before ever. Um, these are highly fact specific. They involve a, a, a cautious analysis of what you're trying to achieve and what you want to accomplish. Uh, and it can, you know, when you're doing standard crew deal memos that people really have no say in the uh, negotiation with, you want to make sure it's worded just the way you want it to be worded. And different agreements can be worded in different ways. And if you're dealing with more sophisticated contracts where there is negotiation, think about how this fits into the negotiation process. And we can advise you on insurance issues and completion bond matters. We got a whole Rolodex filled with, you know, experts and, um, and brokers and analysts and, uh, they can help you achieve what you want to achieve. Um, although, uh, following one of our, our last desk side chat, a, a very uh, significant production company that makes big independent productions and regularly does so, um, they contacted us because uh, they had heard, uh, you know, through this rumor mill based on uh, you know these desktop uh, chats that 
Pierce Law Group can figure out a way to get insurance on this, that they have the answer. Uh, and uh, I said, well, as of today, the answer is there's no carrier that's writing these policies. We can uh, help you draft things that sidestep insurance, um, maybe create things that look similar to insurance. Um, but if the idea is you need a recognized, um, well-funded insurance carrier to issue a policy so you can get your completion bond, so you can get your financing, you know, as of today, our magic wand is not working um, and we can't create a, uh, an insurance carrier to provide coverage uh, if there are no insurance carriers to provide coverage. Um, I would very much like to work with them and, and understand you know, what their economic analysis is and their cost benefit of, of risk versus premium is to try and um, encourage them that they still should write these policies and, and why these COVID-19 um, protocols will work. But insurance carriers are a pretty conservative bunch and they'd rather wait and see how things play out rather than just issue a policy and say, well, this will be fun, let's see what happens. Especially when they have so many previously unanticipated, unexpected claims that they never thought at the start of 2020 they would be having to pay out on. Um, and again, there's our phone number, there's our website, um, directly at piercellp.com. Uh, there's a, a link that will take you to our lovely client director uh, and uh, the appropriate Pierce Law Group attorney will uh, respond to you. Uh, and we have, um, we, you know, we have some folks that are really sharp with financing, others are really sharp with uh, uh, labor and employment issues. Um, I'm kind of the jack of all trades that uh, um, is, I'm extremely proficient in all areas that the, the firm practice, which I guess is the reason why my name is on the door. Um, also, you can uh, see a number of my articles uh, that I have published over the years for Movie Maker Magazine, and we'll be doing another one uh, very shortly for Movie Maker on this very issue. Um, those can be found at moviemaker.com, and aside from me writing, uh, Movie Maker has a whole slew of um, columnists and guest columnists uh, and reporters that are following these stories. And if you're friends with Peter Baxter, or you've uh, you know got the right contact at Slam Dance, um, the folks over there are pretty darn knowledgeable as well, and they have some amazing filmmakers' resources. Um, this website that uh, was kind of uh, you know partially a brainchild uh, in conjunction with them uh, is 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 but one of their many resources and their commitment to independent filmmakers and to helping your guys out in a real esprit de corps spirit that is uh, independent film. Um, some relevant articles uh, I, I have uh, published uh, and I can, or not, I haven't published that I have found and, and uh, aggregated. Um, I have available um, those that are interested in them along with specific links to every state federal and international uh, website source that deals with COVID-19 and safety issues. We have them all chronicled. We can make them uh, available to you. They're available to our, our clients at no cost. If you're not a client, um, you know, we can have a consultation with you and, and make some of that stuff available to you. Um, but if you're not a client, why aren't you? You should come on in. We're, we're pretty good at, uh, um, helping you work through uh, whatever problems you can. But if you don't use Pierce Law Group, please, one thing that you should walk away from this thing is use someone. Don't fly by the seat of your pants. You know, recognize that there are experts out there and get some well-seasoned, well-trained production counsel to work with you. Find you know, medical consultants that can work with you. Find the experienced line producers and safety coordinators. You know, develop a rapport with an insurance broker. 
Talk to your union signatory reps. Let them know that proactively you care about these things. Let them know what you're doing and pick their brain about the information that they have, which they acquire from what others are doing. And that's pretty much uh, the, uh, the focus of our talk. Um, I hope there are folks out there that uh, found this useful and helpful. Um, it's just a broad overview. Um, next month, we'll be back with um, some, some further information. Maybe it'll still be about COVID-19. Maybe we'll go off in a different direction and talk about important things that you should know about financing your film or clearance issues, things of that nature. Um, but take it serious. Uh, remember, we're only making a movie here. You know, nobody should ever have to die because we're just making a movie. And I have a whole separate collection and a whole separate speech about o OSHA safety in general and how inherently dangerous filmmaking is. And I'm a big supporter of guerrilla filmmaking, right? Do what you can to get what you can when you need to get it. But, you know, there's a big red light and stop sign when any of that guerrilla stuff in any way, shame or form compromises safety on the set. You know, um, you don't want to be in a midnight rider situation where, you know, people die on a movie set because they just blatantly disregarded and went gorilla. Couldn't get a location release from a train company. We'll just go on the tracks and have someone yell if a train is coming. Yeah, you didn't map out the physics of how fast a train is coming before people need to get off that bridge before they're killed. And um, the uh, the folks found uh, culpable for that are uh, are being hauled back into court. They spent some jail time. They're on parole. The parole. They violated their parole because uh, they're back engaging in filmmaking, and they didn't think the. Uh, the authorities were going to find out they did, and um, they're they're not happy. They're the rule that said you are not to ever be engaged in the profession of filmmaking again, or perhaps for some period of years, um, was was not uh, was was not taken seriously by the people that had that imposed against them, and now they'll feel the full weight of the law as a result of that. So please don't let that be you. Safety's got to be everyone's business. Safety needs to be your business. I hope you enjoyed the seminar and uh, please come back, tell your friends and it will be posted probably come Monday. It will be posted on YouTube um, and I believe it'll be up on Movie Maker Magazine site and the Pierce Law Group site itself. So until then, thank you and remember to tip your waitresses. <laughs>